Welcome to Michigan Reimagined, a Spotlight <clears throat> Podcast. And here's your host, Chris Buck. So after the Great Recession of 2008 that lasted throughout the early teens, the U.S. economy had the, the historic stretch of prosperity until the pandemic that began in 2020. Now we're talking about looming recession. So here to discuss where we've been and where we might be headed as an economy is the managing partner for Wagoner Financial, Mr. Eric Wagoner. Welcome to the show, Eric. Great to be here, Chris. So let's start a little bit with your credentials. Um, you know, I, I consider you as, as a thought leader, and I noticed that you've got a ton of the alphabet suit behind your last name. I know you're a student of the game, but nobody else does. So tell me a little bit about your your pedigree and the things that you know. Well, thought leader is giving me a, probably a lot of credit that I that that maybe goes a little bit beyond uh, what I actually know. You know, um, the thing to know about me is I went to Michigan State and I was a wrestler there and I studied math and astrophysics. So I got bachelor's degrees in math and astrophysics. I wanted to be a, I wanted to study black holes. Huh. OK. Yeah. And that's what I started <laughs> off doing I as got a wrestler, a, too. Yeah. Yeah. I was a uh, uh, the only wrestler in the in the astrophysics program, the only right. uh, physics major on the wrestling team at the time. But uh, okay, but so uh, I wanted to study black holes. Got a, ma- a master's degree in math, and I started working on my PhD uh, doing mathematical modeling of black holes. But for me, the real black hole was graduate school. It was having a hard time escaping <laughs> its uh, gravitational pull. And I also started to realize through that process as I was in grad school and teaching, I, I was teaching math and physics at the time because that's kind of what you have to do to work your way through grad school. Okay. And I started to realize that there was something that I was missing, which was just the business environment, helping people. I, what I loved about teaching was, was the interaction with the students and the learning process and the give and take that I had with them. I absolutely loved that. But what I didn't love was that once they graduated, I never saw them again. Right. So... I started to realize that if I went into the financial industry and started working with clients, maybe in an advisory capacity, then it was kind of like teaching and educating. I got that I got to brainstorm with clients and still solve problems like in math. Right. But now I got to stay with the clients longer and we got to develop friendships and have longer relationships and we got to see the outcome of of uh, you know of our ideas and, and, and our implementation of those ideas over a longer period of time. So that's what I found really attractive about that. So I, I left graduate school started working in the financial industry. And in the, in the beginning, it was just me working out of my bedroom and I was just hustling. And I went back and in, in that process, I like to read, I like to learn, I like to you know work with clients to help solve problems. So I became a certified financial planner, a chartered financial analyst, which is an investment designation. Uh, I got a couple more, but all those designations really say is that I like to learn and I like to read and if you're going to learn that stuff anyway to solve you know, to solve a problem for someone, you might as well take a test and get a designation. So that's where those things came from. Later, I went back and got a master's degree in global finance from all my other degrees are from Michigan State, but I went back and got a master's degree in global finance from uh, NYU okay. Stern School of Business, which was a joint program with Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and that's the story of how those designations came about. That's fantastic, and I think you know it, it, I wouldn't say it's a crowded space, but there are plenty of financial planners out there that are going to do it. So I think part of that is an expression of, um, you know, your, your willingness to, to stay relevant, right. And stay on top of it. And all of those things probably have a continuing education requirement. So it's important for me that my financial planner isn't just coasting, right. That isn't just kind of cruising towards retirement and collecting their fees. I mean, I want someone who's like really on it. Right. So that, that, that's why I was impressed by you. Absolutely. They all have a continuing education requirement and don't forget the fee, right? Right. Yeah, so you got <laughs> right. it. But, um, you know, it's interesting that tax laws, they don't, you know, they're not just written on stone tablets and we all just read them for all time and they're ever, you know, they're never changing. Right. We just passed uh, the SECURE Act uh, 2.0. So we spent uh, a couple hours just reviewing that yesterday in my office. These are something, these are things that you really have to stay on top of, um, for the benefit of the clients that you're working with. So, you- so talk about the office. So you have a team, right? You're not just an independent person, right? You've got a squad, you got a building, you know, and you serve clients. So talk a little bit about your team. And, um, you know, I don't know if your clients are all over the board or whether there's someone that's kind of in your wheelhouse. It's like my clients tend to be these kinds of people or these kinds of companies. I mean, talk a little bit about your practice. Oh, well, so we have, I think, nine uh, employees now. So, like I said, when I first started off, it was just me working out of my bedroom. But you can right. view me as kind of Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, <laughs> you know, as I went on my journey, I, I found people that were smarter and, 
and uh, more talented than I was to join me. And so I'm just you know one of the one of the cast of characters uh, that works in our office. I, I work. I, I'm very fortunate. I work with some of the absolute most smartest, best, most talented people. And I just I'm lucky. I feel lucky every day just to walk into the office and get get a chance to work with them. So um, thanks for you know the, the, yeah, the yeah. shout out to my team. You know, when it comes to the clients that we work with, we work with a broad spectrum of clients, and I categorize them three ways. We have clients that are just starting off on their financial journey. They've got young families, um, maybe young kids, maybe they're single, uh, maybe they're, they're, they're new in their career. And I call those clients our prosper clients. And what they're doing is they're trying to use their income to generate assets. You know, they haven't, they haven't built their nest egg yet. Okay. So we're working with those clients on budgeting, saving strategies, Roth IRAs, basic insurance, basic wills and trusts. We're talking about basic uh, estate planning, uh, 529 plans, college saving plans. Then our next type of client would be, you can think of them as a pre-retiree or already retired clients. And they already have assets. They've already saved. And so they're using their, we call those our venture clients, and they're using their assets to generate income. Right. So what we're doing with them is retirement income modeling, stress testing. I'm talking to them a lot about the markets and different opportunities or, or, or things that we want to avoid in the markets, long-term tax efficiency. They have a bigger ship. They have a bigger boat to yep. steer. And so we have to look a little bit further out into the future to steer that boat efficiently. And our third type of client is what we call our, inter- they're what we call our enterprise clients and they're, they're business owners typically. Okay. Uh, small, small to intermediate sized businesses. And we're working with them on their 401ks, group benefits, things to make their, to help their employees, um, you know, value the company more. Uh, we're working with them on strategic planning, um, and succession planning would be another topic that we that we cover there, and just brainstorming. I'm a business owner myself, so I think that that's something that's a little unique that we bring to the table. Is that you know I run a, I'm a financial advisor, but we run a business also, and so um, we have a lot of good business ex- discussions with those clients. Um, our job there is really to to help a business owner go from being a, a business owner to maybe a CEO of an enterprise. Okay, to transform their business into something that's that's a little bigger. It's hard to walk away from a business and retire from a business because businesses tend to evaporate. But if you are the CEO of an of a, a enterprise, then now you have, you've built a legacy. It's something that can operate or run without you. And we really try to put them in a position to do that. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> definitely a much needed skill set and uh, succession planning. And yeah, the whole, if you get hit by a bus, the company closes because everything's up here in my brain instead of on paper and in systems that everyone lives and knows intimately. I often sound like the Grim Reaper, but you have to think like that. Yeah, you know? absolutely, yeah. So with all of that in mind, um, your job, honestly, is to help accu- you know, help your clients accumulate wealth and, and grow it. And so, you know, in my, in my uh, intro, I talked about, you know, we had this massive recession, and then we had this huge stretch of prosperity. Then we have this global pandemic that obviously puts a lot of the, the economy in certainly turmoil, you know, some things were good and some things were bad. And now we're talking about looming recession and all of that. And with everything that you study in your, your, your chronic reading habits and stuff, it, it's gotta be so hard to try to, to, you know, they say you can't time the market, right. And try to predict where things are going, but I'm going to ask you, Hey, predict where things are going. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, I mean, what, what, what's the, you know, what's the, what's the word, you know, there, there's a million different ways to define a recession. Some people say by this a definition, we're already in a recession, but unemployment is over here. So that is kind of contrary to it. But what do you think we're in now? And where do you think things might look like in 12, 18, 24 months? Yeah, no, that's a So first off, I, I do want to point out that I don't have a crystal ball. I can't sure. <laughs> predict anything with any uh, degree of certainty. So, you know, I want everyone to know that. That being said, I view investing uh, like being like sailing the ocean, although I'm not a sailor either. <laughs> but, you know, you have to you don't know when the wind is going to blow and you don't know how hard it's going to blow, but you do know that it will eventually. Right. And so if you're captaining that ship, you've got to have the sails up when the, when the opportunity comes along, you have to be ready to take advantage of it and you have to have the ship pointed in the right direction. And so that's how I view investing. We, you know, we're always uh, positioning our clients, our clients, financial situations and their assets so that when the wind blows, then they can take advantage of it. Right. So, as far as the you know whether we're in a recession or not, I think we are. Um, the technical definition of a recession is two quarters of negative GDP growth, two successive quarters of negative GDP growth. We already had that in Q1 and Q2 of 2022. So 
the powers that be haven't declared that we're in a recession, but I, I think they have a reason to, you know, it's their job to avoid it. Right. So they're not going to be quick to, to recognize it. But I think that we're, you know, there's a difference between what happened in the pandemic and what's happening right now. The pandemic was a quick mispricing of assets, right? We had a, a very, the pandemic was, was short in time and we were all, we were home a lot. It felt like a long time, but as far as the stock market, the stock market, you know, came down quite a bit, but it, it, it came up very quickly. So I would call that a, a mispricing of assets, and that was something to take advantage of, and we did. But what we're in right now is more of a structural change and a repricing of assets. And so there's a good reason why the market is pulling back right now, and I can get into that if you'd like. But Sure. Yeah. What are you hearing? Well, I'll tell you what. If you want to understand what's going on right now, then you just have to look at the Federal Reserve and their balance sheet. And I don't want to get too technical, but we printed a lot of money. Yes. <laughs> we printed a lot of money to put that. You, know, you don't need to know all the specifics, but the Federal Reserve's balance sheet was about $800 billion in 2008. And now it's over $8 trillion, I think, or somewhere around $8 trillion, a thousand percent higher. So uh, you don't need to know everything that that entails, but um, you can tell that that's, that's not normal. And that's a very quick, rapid increase in, in, uh, in the amount of money that's in the economy. So we printed a lot of money. We did that in 2008 because we were sick. We had a financial sickness, and so we, we took some financial medicine. And what we didn't get was inflation. Everyone thought we would, but we didn't get it. And because we didn't get it, we just kept taking that medicine. I mean, there was no, there was no negative impact of that. So we, you know, so we just kept printing money. You used to hear people talk about Social Security being underfunded. Yeah. You don't hear that anymore. And people don't talk about that anymore. And, the, and part of the reason is we don't need to raise taxes if we can just print money and there's no negative consequences. But of course there are. And so those, took, those consequences took a while to kind of work their way through the system. We finally got the inflation that we were expecting. And now I think everybody, the listeners of your program, me, the, the, our politicians, I think we realize that we have to find a different way. And so we're in the process of unraveling all of those loose money uh, policies and we're making money a lot tighter now. Makes sense. So, <clears throat> but it still seems like there's a, a hell of a debt to pay. Like, how do we, <laughs> you know, what does a correction look like? And I'm not an expert in this by any stretch. Um, how do we get rid of $8 trillion worth of money that we printed? Because part of me as a citizen says, okay, this problem caused this reaction, right? So we were always capable of printing trillions of dollars to fix the problem we deemed worthy enough. But what about... Uh, hunger, you know, what about homelessness? What about bridges and roads? What about, I mean, all this stuff where we're saying things are crumbling, people are, are in need, but there's no solution for that. Then all of a sudden this comes along and all of a sudden we have the money. I don't know. I take a little exception to that, but at the end of the day, there's always a price to pay for overextending yourself, whether it's your home budget or whether it's the national debt. I don't know. There's not really a question there, but yeah. help me unpack some of that. No, you know, so I don't think. I mean, not that, the moral side of it. I'm yeah, sure no, you know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't necessarily think there's a lot of blame to go around because when we when we printed the money in 2008, it, it turned out to have very positive effects. In fact, our we, we recovered a lot faster than other economies in other countries. I think that that the emergency measures that we put in 2008, they made a lot of sense. And, and it's one of the reasons why we were really nimble and uh, really managed the 2000, you know, we could, 2008 could have been a lot worse. So now is that the housing collapse and like automotive bankruptcies and like, are those the things that we, you're talking oh, yeah. about? Okay. Oh yeah. We had real problems. We had yeah, yeah. The, 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 the way to think about 2008 is that the stuff that banks, you, you know, banks can't lend all their money. They got to keep some of it safe and they got to put some of it in the vault. Well, the stuff that they thought was safe was the stuff that was the least safe. <laughs> right. And they were really surprised by that. So it, we really had a structural problem with the financial system. It could have been a lot worse. And it was these emergency measures, pr printing money being one of them. You remember things like TARP and quantitative easing, remember those topics. Those things actually saved us. And this is one of the things I, I, I teach, yeah. on, you know, I, I lecture on. But, uh, and then when the pandemic came around, it seemed like we were going to have another one of those things. So I think the Federal Reserve was was smart to, to, to print a lot of money and just and see what, you know, see what happened. But it turned out that although the pandemic is a, is a health crisis, it wasn't necessarily a financial crisis. And so we took a lot of financial medicine when we weren't necessarily financially sick. So what the Fed has to do, just like they print money, they needed to burn it. <laughs> and they can just burn it. And t taking money out of the system once people are used to it um, can be very painful. Right. Okay. 
And is that like fuel prices and eggs are the current thing? And like it just it bubbles up. Do they know where that's going to bubble up or does that just kind of happen? If you don't do something about it, something will be done for you. Right. And what's done for us is inflation. Because if we're all taking things off of shelves and we're not putting things back on shelves, right? Or if we're taking cookies out of the cookie jar, but not baking extra cookies to put back in, what happens is those last cookies become very expensive, right. very valuable. It's the right. last cookie, right? So, you know, if we don't, if we don't do something about it, then something will be done for us. And it's inflation. If you think about inflation, it's really just a mechanism to make us all work harder because when we have 9% inflation, that means that we all have to work an extra afternoon. And what do we get for that extra work? Well, we get to keep what we had. We don't get anything extra out of that. So inflation is a mechanism for making us all work harder. The problem with inflation, though, is that some people are strapped. You know, maybe there are some people that have some slack and, and working a little hard is not such a big deal. But there are some people that are strapped. And when, you know, when, when food prices go up, then there are going to be people that are actually hungry. And when energy prices go up, there are going to be people that actually can't move from one location to, they can't move their bodies because they can't afford the gas. They can't move from one location to another. So inflation can be very painful. And I'm very happy that our policymakers and people in general are recognizing the, the danger that inflation actually represents. And so what the Federal Reserve is trying to do now, and all of us in the money system, we're trying to come up with a better way. So raising interest rates, pulling money out of the system, getting a, a control on inflation, it's going to cause some layoffs, but those layoffs, although painful, are less painful than the inflation itself. So hmm. it's a necessary process. Got it. So, so what I'm taking from this whole conversation is, is that your metaphor on sailing in the ocean, right? I mean, there, there's going to be pain, there's going to be lulls, there's going to be heavy winds we almost can't handle or all that kind of stuff. But I, I hear in your tone and your delivery, a general sense of confidence that no matter how bad things get from one end to the other, there are some checks and balances and reasonably smart people that are kind of manning that sailboat. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic and positive. And, you know, every... Every recession or every stock pullback, there's always something, there's usually something new that caused it. Uh, so you want to identify what's different, but most of the things are the same. Right. So most of what we're going through is just a run of the mill pullback, run of the mill stock repricings. There's no, in my view, there's no real reason to be you know, overly concerned or overly fearful of what's going on in the market. In fact, I feel the opposite. You know, the best time to take a piece of pie is when the pie is being passed. <laughs> okay. So, so you always, you know, you'll find your best opportunities amidst chaos. When, you know, when, when there are, th when there are you know, shifting winds, when there are things that look chaotic, when people are being emotional or irrational, that's where you find your best opportunities. And you got to be savvy and you got to take advantage of those things. And you got to recognize that those represent opportunities. Right. <clears throat> so as we kind of start getting ready to close this conversation out is the you know, what are the opportunities? Like what, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking kind of Q1 of 2023 as we, as we have this conversation, end of January, what, um, like what should be people be looking for? You know, um, yeah, obviously you need to be somewhat savvy and you have to have a kind of a, a plan. Um, but what might be happening that people could take advantage of? Well, I would just say in general that your money is going to have to work harder because there's less of it. People might have to work a little bit harder because they have a little bit less money. So you can make money with your hands or with your money. Those are two ways to make money, with your hands or with your money. If there's less money, the money has to work harder. And if there's less money, you might have to, you know. Use your hands. Use your hands a little bit. <laughs> um, but, you know, you used to, in the last, money was so easy in the, and credit was so easy and free flowing in the last 14 years that, that we, we weren't necessarily selective about our opportunities. And, and one of the, the drawbacks of that is that you, you didn't get paid a very good interest rate or, or a good yield on safe, you know, bonds, bonds didn't really pay you very much. U.S. Treasury bills paid you nothing, roughly nothing. So you weren't, you didn't get credit for just being a run of the mill saver. And nowadays you're starting to, banks are raising their interest rates on, on deposits and treasury bills were yielding 4.3%. So you're actually getting paid on safe money just to be a responsible, you know, saver or responsible lender. So that's an opportunity for people. I think that that's, that is welcome. If you're a retirement, uh, if you're a retiree and you've got a retirement nest egg, uh, and you're holding a portfolio of bonds, those bonds should start yielding more. And, you know, I, I don't know for sure, but it's likely that those bonds will yield more in the future. And then also I would say that we're in a stock picker's market, which we weren't in in 2021. Remember 2021, everything was up. Bitcoin was up, you know, everything was up. And that's because we were at the end of a speculative bull, bull run and we had a lot of easy money. But now if you look at 2022, it's not true that all things were down. 
there were certain types of stocks that, that did pretty well, and those were typically dividend payers. The energy sector was quite up. So what I would say is that, that we're moving forward. We're, we're, Warren Buffett has a quote that in the short run, the stock market is a voting machine, but in the long run, it's a weighing machine. And so we are in a weighing machine type of market where if you're smart, there's certainly opportunities around, but you have to, you know, you have to throw some stocks out and, 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 and put more of your eggs on, on the ones that you think are good. So right on. A lot of opportunity. And I guess another message that you would probably send out is it's hard to do this as just a person. You need someone like you who can help you understand how to sell, right? It's hard to do it if you do it full time like <laughs> we do. It, we, it, right. You know, we're, we're having our investment committee meetings. We're, we're, we're debating constantly in the office. So, yeah, it's, just, it's a tough it's a tough uh, business where you're always trying to, to, to eke out an extra, you know, couple percentage points. Right sure. on. Well, uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. We've been talking to the managing partner for Wagoner Financial, Eric Wagoner. Eric, thanks for joining me today. I hope to have you back on sometime soon. Oh, it's a real pleasure. Thanks, Chris. 